Sean. Anyway, I think that's enough insulting of a former friend for one night. What have you been up to? Sean asked. Sean lay sprawled out on his bed naked. His left hand played with his testicles enthusiastically, while his right held the phone to his ear. I've been good, man. I actually just kept up, uh, met up with uh, Kelly Patrick today, Rich said. Oh yeah? How's that chick doing? Sean asked. She's gotten super hot. Like, really hot, man. I was shocked when I saw her, Rich said. What? Really? That's interesting. Quite hard to imagine if I do say so myself, Sean drawled. Yeah, you would have been shocked. She kept saying how New York changed her, Rich said. Sean snorted. Sounds stupid. New York has changed her? Yeah, apparently she just fucks a bunch of dudes now. It's pretty fucking ridiculous. She's just living it up here. Sean sat up out of curiosity. Is that so? Kelly Patrick is bragging about being a whore. Yeah, she called herself a slut. She was bragging about how she didn't even have to walk into a bar anymore to pick up a guy. She would just get stopped before she reached the door, Rich said. What? Sean exclaimed. And she would go home with them? Yeah. She told me about how one guy took her home after meeting her and gave like a dozen orgasms that night, Rich said. Sean's penis started to become erect. That's fucking ridiculous. Oh my god, that's incomprehensible. Kelly Patrick is a hot New York slut? Yep. I was pretty fucking shocked as well. Listen, I, I went to the bathroom for like a second. I came back. There was a guy sitting in my chair telling her that she, he was better than the guy she had come with, a.k.a. me. That happened like two more times, Rich said. What? Sean said in disbelief. That kind of shit actually happens? Yeah, man. That shit was happening. Every fucking guy there was looking at me all pissed because they thought I was with her, Rich said. Oh my god, you should so totally fuck her, Sean said. There was a short silence over the phone as Sean waited for Rich's response. I definitely can't do that, Rich said finally. Why not? Sean asked. She's going around fucking rich New Yorkers. They have their own apartments and shit, giving her multiple, multiple orgasms and whatnot. I can't compete with that, Rich said. Don't be an idiot, Sean said excitedly. Listen, you don't understand the female psychology. I do. You dumped her. You dumped her. That carries over for a very long time. Why do you think she even wanted to see you tonight? She wanted to show how hot she's gotten. She's bragging about the guy she was fucking to make you think you were missing out. She wanted you to think you fucked up in dumping her. You didn't compliment her, did you? Not really, I guess, Rich said. Good. You could fuck her, man. You could so fuck her. All you have to do is not compliment the bitch, play her off, just come off as if you're not impressed by anything that she does. She'll want to prove it to you. She'll want to show you what you've been missing. You could fuck her as long as you don't let her think that she's won. I'm telling you, Sean said. I don't know. That's all well and good, but the whole time I was talking to her, all I could think was that I don't give girls multiple orgasms when I fuck them. I'd look like an idiot. She'd probably laugh about me to her New York friends, Rich said. You can't think like that, man. You can't look at it like that. The only thing you should focus on is the fact that you want to fuck her. It's a great feeling to fuck a girl that other guys want to fuck. It's an outstanding feeling, Richard, Sean said emphatically. Rich groaned over the phone. I won't say anything more on the subject. I have absolute confidence in you. I know you could if you wanted to. Just call me and I'll walk you through it. How's the one bitch that you met? Are you still banging her? Sean asked. No, Rich said. You're so weird, man. You probably did something to fuck that up, didn't you? I don't understand you, man. The minute you start having consistent sex with someone, you find the quickest way to ruin it. You're a conundrum, Sean said. Fuck her, Rich said. Was she ugly, Richard? You can tell me. She was just okay. She's a small, rich Jew with a fake nose. That's pretty much all there is to her. Was she more attractive than Jennifer? Sean asked. Sinem's face appeared as she climbed the steps to Sean's floor. She looked over at, him, over at him and saw that he was naked and laughed. She shook her head with a huge smile on her face. She walked over to him and Sean grabbed her and bent her over his torso with one hand. He slapped her ass. Definitely more attractive than her, Rich said. Well, listen, man, it's going to take more than one phone conversation to figure you out. But I plan on knowing you for a very long time, and I'm not going to rest until you get the things that you deserve. Mark my words, I'm going to take care of you, buddy. Believe that. I gotta go, Sean said. Rich laughed faintly into the phone. Thanks, man. I'll talk to you later. I love you, Richie boy. Hey, uh, could you not tell anyone about me hanging out with Kelly? I, I just don't want people knowing about it, Rich said. Anything for you, buddy. I'll talk to you later. Sean hung up the phone. Sinem looked at Sean, a smile still on her face. 
That was your friend Richard, she asked. Yes. Good job using your context clues to deduce that, Sean said sarcastically. He tossed his phone off the bed and placed his other hand on, onto Sanem's ass. He squeezed with both hands. How is he doing in New York, she asked. Being queer as always. Not queer in the gay sense, but queer in the what the fuck is wrong with people sense, Sean said. What is he doing wrong, Sanem asked. He's just fucking weird. He's always been weird. He has like zero confidence with girls. It's actually really interesting if you want to listen. Richard repeatedly gets more attractive girls to like him than any other member of YFC. Repeatedly. Every single one, mind you, manages to have super nice breasts, but that's besides the point. The point is that whenever an attractive girl likes him, for, he, for all intents and purposes, runs away. I've seen him do it time and time again. He'll meet an attractive female, he'll go on and on about how much he wants to fuck her, and then the moment he finds out that she's interested in him, he runs away. He finds something about her to complain about and acts as if he never liked her in the first place. It's ridiculous, Sean said. Wow, that's crazy, Sanem said. It is. It's really frustrating because the girls that end up liking him are always so hot. And I, I just want him to score one for the team, if not for himself, you know what I mean? Sean asked. Are you saying that you want to have sex with the girls that try to have sex with him? Sanem asked. Of course not, Sean said with a hint of sarcasm. All I want is for Richie to stop it. I don't know what his problem is, but it's something he really needs to fix about himself. We've talked about it before. He, he needs more confidence. He finds out that a girl likes him, and he loses interest because he's confused as to why she would like him. He thinks there must be something wrong with them for them to want to have sex with him. That sounds horrible, Sanem said. Yeah, it's very horrible. Very, very horrible. I really hope he grows out of it. He's not, hap he's not going to be happy with himself if he doesn't. But Sean, that isn't your problem. All of your friends are fucked up in my opinion, but you don't have to worry about it. You're not living their lives. Leave them alone. Let them be miserable if they want to, Sanem said. Two things are wrong with that statement. The first one is, you are of the opinion that Joe and Chris are my friends. They aren't. Maybe at some point in time they were, but definitely not anymore, Sean said. Then what are they then, Sanem asked. You hang out with them, so what are they? They're people who I happen to share the same type of humor with. I hang out with them because they make me laugh, that's it. Chris can only stand to hang out with me when he's high, which I can accept, but he's not my friend. He's a person that I smoke weed with and tell jokes with. In the past, we used to have a common goal that was to film and become famous movie stars, which I hate to admit to someone like you. Now that that's over, and I use Joe and Chris for nothing but laughs, Sean said. Sinem sat up and pulled away from Sean's grasp. Her face was screwed up in confusion. What do you mean, someone like me? She asked testily. Take it as a compliment. When I first started dating you, I was ashamed of the thoughts that went through my head daily. I was ashamed of that stupid passion I used to have. I felt like a kid dating an adult. So I quickly put it to bed. Very quickly. I grew up for you, Sean grinned widely. Something that I should actually thank you for. I needed it. Sanem looked at Sean for a moment, then smiled. You're welcome, she said. I didn't know you took it so seriously. I thought it was just a hobby. It was never a hobby for me. I can't speak for them, but I don't think it was a hobby for any of us. It was stupid, though. I, I hate thinking about it. It's funny because we actually won a film competition. I just found out today. We won this thing where you had to make a film in 24 hours. We'd won it before, but this time it was entered into Philly and L.A., and our shit won both cities, Sean said. Seriously? That's really good, Sean. L.A. is where the movies are made, Sanem said. Sean rolled his eyes at the obvious comment. Yeah, uh, now we're entered to win the national competition. They're having a showcase of all the city's winners in December. They announced the overall winner there. If we win, I think we get like $7,000 or something like that. I don't really know. I, I could give a fuck less. Wow, that's really good though, Sean. Are you going to go? Sinem asked. <laughs> Probably. Kyle, the director of the whole thing, is flying in from L.A. to go to the thing, so I'd like to go show my support. I have no investment in the outcome, though, Sean said. Why not? Because it hurts too much. It's something I used to care a lot about. I just want to get as far away as possible. I don't want to hope for success anymore. I just can't. I can go to the showcase and support everyone that worked on the thing, but I can't hope to win it. I don't want to try and succeed in that field anymore. I've made so much progress. I'm really happy, Sean said. Before, I used to feel pain whenever I overheard some co-workers talking about movies, or someone will talk about some actor that they think is really good. 
Oh my god. The worst was seeing black actors anywhere. Derek Luke and Jamie Foxx in a new movie or TV show or Michael B. Jordan. But I'm literally feeling all that anger and resentment and envy ebb away. It's weird. It's like I'm aware of it happening every second of it. Something I used to care about, something I used to be passionate about, I hardly think about. It scares me. Why does it scare you, Sinem asked. Because what if it comes back, Sean asked. He looked into Sinem's eyes, searching for an understanding. He saw none. She nodded her head, and Sean wondered if she was even listening. He didn't blame her. In fact, he thanked her for it. The less she understood, the more encouragement it gave him to forget about it and move on. I want to move on, he repeated out loud. With you, Sean said, pinching her cheek. Sinem smiled warmly at Sean. All I need in my life is you. I could be whatever you want me to be. You could get me to be a doctor if that's what you wanted, and I would do it for you. As long as you stay the way you are, Sean said. Hmm, Sinem said with a smile. I don't want you to get a big head, though. I don't think you're perfect, Sean said. Is that so? Sinem asked, grinning. She reached over and tried to pinch Sean's cheek. What would you change about me? That, Sean said, laughing, dodging her pinch once more. What else? Sinem asked. Well, since you asked, I want you all to myself all the time. But I'm a realistic person, and I know that can't happen. You go to school, you have your internship, and you have your family and friends. All those things require a certain amount of attention, respectively. The one big thing I would change about you is that when you get to me, you're with me. I can wait until the end of the world to be in your presence, but when I finally get it, I don't want your attention divided with other things, Sean said. He chose his words carefully. He had been preparing to have this conversation for some time now. He had steered Sinem gracefully into the topic, having already prepared his monologue. My attention isn't divided with other things when I'm with you, Sinem said, frowning. In this very moment, it isn't. In this very moment, you're looking at me and we're having a conversation, but today was my day off as it was yours. I had been looking forward to seeing you all day. You texted me at four saying that you would get to me at seven. Seven came and went and you told me you would get to me at nine. That passed too. Now I'm not trying to say that I'm mad, honey. The point that I'm trying to reach is that you got to me at eleven o'clock when you had initially said seven. Sanem opened her mouth to say something, but Sean put a finger over her lips. Please let me finish, and then you can speak. You got to me at eleven after I'd been waiting for you literally all day. I did my best to busy myself with other things, to not feel like a loser sitting at home with his thumb up his ass waiting for his girlfriend. But yes, I was very happy when I finally got to pick you up and take you to my house. I'm not ashamed to admit that. And Sanem, you were on your phone the whole time you were in the car with me. You barely said two words to me. Then we get home and I think that we're going to go straight up to my room and have a passionate lovemaking session since we hadn't seen each other in a week. And instead, I witnessed you stepping into my brother's room and having a 15-minute conversation with him while I waited upstairs for you, Sean said. Sanem sighed, exasperated. Oh my God, Sean, are you serious right now? You're mad because I said hi to your brother, she asked condescendingly. I'm not mad, and you did not say hi to my brother. A hi takes less than a second to say. You were down there for 15 minutes. I just hope you can understand where I'm coming from. I've been waiting since 7, before 7 even, to see you. You get to me four hours later than you promised, and then instead of actually having you to myself, which is something I've wanted to do this entire day, you go into my brother's room and have a conversation with him. I understand that you guys are friends and that you've known him for a long time, but you didn't come here to talk to my brother, Sinem. You see him at work. You came here to be with me. Do you understand? Sean asked. It looks like you've been wanting to say this for a long time, Sinem said, laughing. Sean ignored the patronizing laugh. Yes, actually I have, he said calmly. Hmm, Sanem said. Do you understand why a person might get upset over this kind of thing? Sean asked. Sanem's eyes turned up to her head as she thought about her answer. Uh, no, I can't understand. It just sounds like you're jealous that I was talking to your brother. Sean took a deep breath and stretched. You know what? Fine, you can say that. Yes, I was jealous that you were talking to my brother, and I don't want you to do it anymore. How's that? That's fine. I don't have to talk to him if you don't want, Sanem said. What I want is for you to be with me when you're with me, Sean said so slowly, hoping that she would understand exactly what he meant. Okay, Sanem said. Got it? Sean asked. Sanem nodded her head in affirmation. Great, Sean said. Now we can have sex. Sean opened his eyes. There was light coming through the windows, though he didn't know what time it was. He guessed it to be around 9 or 10. 
He looked at his sleeping partner that lay on his left. He stared at her for a moment. Her face looked calm and peaceful. Sean leaned over and kissed her cheek lightly. The dream he was having, before he woke, started to fade from his memory. A lingering smile on the face of his last lover was all that he could remember. And sex. He had been inside legs in the dream. He had fucked her as he had in real life, hard and passionate, full of lust and anger. The guilt that Sean had from having those dreams was finally starting to fade. He started accepting, accepting them as part of his day. At night, he would have tender, loving sex with his Persian queen, and in the morning, he would dream of physically damaging the whore that he once had and gave up. Sean didn't miss her. He refused to acknowledge that he missed her, yet he had no choice but to accept the fact that he dreamed of her. Sean quietly got out of bed, making sure not to stir some men. He slipped some pajama pants on and headed downstairs to the bathroom. His brother was already up, watching some movie on Netflix in the living room to Sean's right. The two passed each other's line of sight without saying a word. Sean walked down the long hallway to the bathroom and left the door open as he did his best to direct his erect penis towards the toilet and pee. He stood on his tiptoes as the urine came flooding out of him. He flushed and rinsed his hands quickly under the sink out of habit. He started down the hallway again. His feet got to the staircase leading up to his room. Sean stopped at the foot of it. He turned his head to look at his brother Rich. You want to know something? Sean asked him. Not particularly, but I'm sure you're going to tell me anyway, Rich mumbled with his usual hoarse voice. Every morning I come down here early to pee, and every morning I see you in that robe that I bought you for your birthday that you most likely haven't washed more than three times in the year that you've had it. I see you on that couch with your pubic hair spilling out of your underwear for the world to see, and it's all I can do to not pity you. I've never wanted to pity my older brother, Sean said. Rich took a deep breath and paused the movie he was watching. Sean noticed it was Friends with Benefits. His brother was watching Friends with Benefits by himself at 9 o'clock in the morning. This is the first time you've spoken to me in this house in the past two months. Literally two months. You say you watch me sit here on this couch and watch movies every morning? How come you don't sit down with me? How come you don't ask how I'm doing? The first thing out of your mouth in two months is an insult. You don't want to pity me? Fuck you. Get off your fucking high horse, you ass. You think you're better than me because you, you're going to college? Be happy with the life that you're living right now and then get back to me, Rich said. I am happy with my life. I'm quite content with it. And yes, I am going to college because I'm thinking about my future. Because I don't want to work at a diner for the rest of my life. Because I want to be able to afford nice things and take my girlfriend out to nice places. I don't know why today I chose to try to talk to you as opposed to yesterday or the day before, but I just wanted to let you know that I hate seeing you like this. Our parents are lucky that you don't live with them anymore because they felt and still do feel the same way that I do right now. We're worried for you, Sean said. Oh yeah? You're worried for me? Rich took a second to rub his nose. Let me explain something to you. I don't take advice from people who have something I don't want. You say that you're happy? I don't see it. What I see is you waiting for it to happen. You don't walk around like a happy person. I do. I'm the happiest guy I know. I do whatever the fuck I want, whenever the fuck I want. You mentioned how you don't want to work at the diner for the rest of your life. I like working at the diner. I love my fucking job. You look at me with pity because I'm watching Friends with Benefits at 9 o'clock in the morning. I'm doing what I want by myself. Unlike you who needs a girl to keep him company that literally has none of the same interests as you. Name the last time you two watched a movie together or did something else that you like doing. And you call that happiness. Fuck you. I'm doing what I want. I have no intention of living up to you or Dad's expectations, Rich said. But what about when you're 40? Sean asked desperately. That's what I'm talking about, Richard. You're not going to be wanting to do this when you're 40. You're going to regret the time that you wasted now watching shitty movies like Friends with Benefits. You're going to regret not discovering how capable you are of achieving anything. I learned Persian in three months, Rich, just because I chose to. I have A's and B's in all of my classes, and it feels good, don't you understand? To know that you aren't wasting your potential. Everyone has talked about how smart you are. Mom and Dad have said, even said openly that you're smarter than me. I just wish you would prove it. I want you to do better than me, not worse. I want to compete against you. You know what? Instead of just being an asshole and just assuming that I'm doing nothing with my life, instead of just walking up to me and insulting me out of nowhere, why don't you try sitting down and asking me what I've been up to? 
why don't you try asking me what my plans are for the fucking future before you just look down your fucking nose at me and walk around thinking that your brother's a loser? Rich asked. Sean stepped into the living room and sat down in the closest armchair. He faced Richard. Okay, he said. What have you been up to? What are your plans for the future, Mr. Hunt? I'm joining the Air Force, he replied. Sean raised his eyebrows in surprise. And when did you make this decision, Sean asked. A couple of weeks ago. I've been waiting to talk to you about it, but like I said, you haven't been the most willing participant of conversation lately, Rich said with a sarcastic smile. Have you started looking into the process, Sean asked. Not yet, Rich said. Well, you should probably get on that. I'm sorry, but I can't take you seriously until I actually see you taking action. All this is right now is talk. You're talking about joining the Air Force. You used to talk about writing a book. Two, in fact. You used to talk about going to the gym with me. That lasted for a week. I'm not trying to be negative, Rich. I would love more than anything else to watch you do something with yourself, Sean said. Rich looked at Sean briefly, then clicked the remote. The movie resumed playing. You're going to have to find a new roommate. You should start looking now, Rich said definitively. Sean considered furthering the conversation. He looked at Rich, feeling frustration and anger at the same time. He shook his head and stood up. Good luck, he said, and headed up the stairs. Sinem was awake and waiting for him when he returned to his room. Where were you? she asked sleepily. Sean walked over to his girlfriend and kissed her on her forehead before getting back in the bed. I was talking to my brother about something. I didn't know you'd be awake this early, Sean said. I wasn't. I woke up when I saw you were gone. I thought you went to the bathroom. Is everything okay? Sinem asked. We'll see, Sean said. He kissed her again. Sean, you know what I was thinking? Sinem asked, her voice thick with her accent. Sean smiled. What were you thinking, honey? He asked her. Can you show me the video that won that competition you were talking about last night? Sean's smile grew wider. Aw, you are such a darling sweetheart, my Ashkin. That's so sweet of you, really. Sure you can see it. Sean leaned over the side of his bed and grabbed his laptop. You have to do something for me, though, Sean said as he logged into the computer and opened up YouTube. What's that? Sinem asked. Save video one more time, Sean requested. Sinem laughed and glared at Sean. She reached over and pinched his cheek. Widio, she said, her V sounding like a W. Sean laughed and leaned over and kissed her. I love you, he said. I love you too, Sinem said as she stared into his eyes. Okay, so let's do this thing. Let me just give you a little information about the competition before I start it. So we are given 24 hours to make a film centered on the topic of one. The film could be about anything as long as it has something to do with the number one. Now you know the members of YFC, at least you know of them. This is our third time during this, uh, this film race. The first time we competed, we lost. The guys who beat us were known as P&K Productions. They're these two really, really talented, really funny guys out of Philadelphia. We beat them the next year for all intents and purposes and won the Philadelphia Award. We play seven in the national comp competition. Long story short, the two groups striked up a kind of friendship. We've done a couple of coll collaborations with them, this video being the latest one. Sean took a breath and laughed. Okay, I think I'm done with the exposition. He clicked the video and it started to play. Kyle was the first person to appear in the video. That's Kyle, Sean explained quietly. He's the K in P&K Productions. He graduated valedictorian of his college class. You are, I'm pretty sure. He just moved to LA a year ago and got a job pretty quickly in a production company, so I'm pretty happy for him. He's a really good dude. Sean let Sanem continue watching the video. He watched her face to gauge her reaction to the humor. He didn't think she would enjoy it, but he appreciated the intention behind it. He gave her more information. Alright, so that redhead is Joe, who was a member of YFC. You could say was, to be more correct, Sean added bitterly. Anyway, he was basically the brains of all of our videos. He directed like 90% of them and came up with most of the ideas. Huge dick, but he really does have great comedic timing. Great vision, too. He would have been a great filmmaker someday if someone ever gave him the chance. Snem nodded her head in comprehension and continued watching the video. Richard's face appeared, and Sean smiled. And that's my best friend, Richie Boy, who you've already met and know about, he said. Who's the one standing next to you right here? Snem asked as she pointed at Christopher. That would be Christopher. Kind of an idiot, but a real natural on camera. I used to call him the tool of YFC, but in a good way, Sean said jokingly. Sean knew the video by heart, even though he had only watched it a handful of times. He waited in anticipation for past performance. He pointed at the screen excitedly when it got to that point. 
Okay, now, fun fact about this guy is that he might be the most talented person out of everyone in this thing. What you're watching right now, Pat did in one take, which is a really big deal in the filmmaking world. It's so crazy to be... It's so crazy, too, because he's like this super shy guy who works full-time in a flower shop. But whenever the camera starts rolling, he becomes a different person. Sean stopped talking and let Sinem watch Pat's performance. His eyes crossed only slightly as he did a subtle portrayal of a man with Asperger's. Sean laughed at his monologue again, the humor not being lost even after watching it several times. Sinem laughed as well as she watched him. One take, Sean repeated to himself in awe. Is he part of YSC or the other group? Sinem asked. He's the P in the P and K. They're both really cool guys, Sean said. That was good, Sanem said as the video ended. You think so? I personally don't like the video. I think everyone in my crew did horrible. Kyle and Pat were funny. I'm shocked we won in L.A., Sean said. Yeah, I thought it was funny, though. The last one, Pat, he was really good, Sanem said. Right? I think he's amazing. And he works at a flower shop, for Christ's sake. It's fucking depressing, Sean said. Why didn't he move to Los Angeles with Kyle? Sinem asked. He has a girlfriend or some stupid shit. Bottom line, he just doesn't want to. I always told myself after I met them and became friends with them that if I ever got successful, the group that we've created would take over Hollywood. At least the comedic side of it, anyway. Pat and Chris and Richard would be huge deals if I had the opportunity to give it to them. Pat especially. Joe and Kyle would be more versatile. They're the fucking visionaries of the group. They look at film as an art and, like, stupid pretentious shit like Tree of Life. They would get bored of comedy after doing it for two years. Sean's voice trailed off. He was doing it again, thinking of the future that he wanted so much. It's okay to talk about it, he told himself. Just don't hope for it. Just don't wish for it. What about you? What did you want to do? Sinem asked. Uh, don't ask. I would have gotten out of comedy as quickly as humanly possible. I signed on for that comedy group in high school because I wanted my face on camera and people to see me, but I hate comedy. I think I suck at it. Everyone I work with is funnier, is way funnier than me, and I have no concept of my own that comes off as funny. Every joke I tell or facial expression I use to get a laugh, I've borrowed from one of those five people that you just saw. I didn't really add anything to the group at all besides ego, if that counts. I was the one who told them that we were good, that we deserved success. I was the driving force of every big project that we've ever made. The producer, if you're familiar with the term. I didn't like it, though. The responsibility. And you can see right now where it's got us. Sinem looked at Sean, waiting for him to continue. It took him a second to realize it. There was someone actually waiting to hear what was in his head. Sean loved intimate moments like these, shared between two people. He was romantic. Last tango in Paris, he thought smugly. He continued. All I wanted out of young, of you, uh, all I wanted out of young folks comedy was recognition and notoriety. The second I had the chance to do what I really wanted, I would have stopped everything to do it. I had such big aspirations to them. I wanted to direct and star in my own production of Hamlet. I already have all the monologues memorized. I wanted to fill the void in Hollywood of that one black movie star. I had all the confidence in the world that I could do it. I just didn't know how. I still don't know. There's no path that leads you to that with 100% certainty. Are the others still trying to be famous? Sinem asked. The question stung. Sean told himself that she hadn't done it intentionally. He weighed the words heavily in his head, feeling stupid and naive yet again. Are the others still trying to be famous? He felt like an idiot pouring his heart out to this girl. It wasn't her fault. He had promised himself that he would never mention any of it to her. He couldn't help it. Not really. Chris has basically stopped functioning completely. He doesn't go to school. He works at Cozy full-time and smokes weed in his free time. Joe and Rich are going to school for it, but that doesn't really mean much. <sighs> Joe's talking about becoming a film teacher at a high school as a quote-unquote backup plan. Sean emphasized using his fingers as bunny ears. So he can just be considered as another write-off. Richard is the only one I still have hopes for. I don't think he'll ever stop trying. Twenty years from now, the world might know his name. I hope he does it too. I really do. Sinem looked at him for a long time, considering. 
Finally, she said, you should be proud of yourself. Why should I be proud of myself, Janan? Sean asked, trying to snap back to the real world. You're much more mature than all of those people. More mature than all of those people. You're going to school for something you can actually make money at. Those people, your friends or whatever, sure they have dreams, but they aren't thinking realistically, Sean. You are. You're going to finish school and get a degree and make money. You're not going to sit around waiting for something to happen like an immature child. Sam leaned over and kissed him on the cheek. And guess what? After you start making money, hundreds of thousands of dollars, you can act on the weekends as a hobby. Everyone has hobbies. You can make acting your hobby if you love it so much, she said cheerfully. Sean nodded his head solemnly. She's right. He tried to convince himself of that. Everything she just said is absolutely right. Then why do I want to scream? Why do I want to run? Sean didn't have an answer. He didn't say anything. The computer screen was still open on the, on the video. The comments were listed below it. There were two. He grabbed the laptop and started typing. What are you doing, Sinem asked curiously. I'm leaving a comment for them, Sean said. Are they going to see it, Sinem asked. Probably a couple weeks from now. Who knows? Sean shrugged. She looked over Sean's shoulder and laughed at the comment. You guys are crazy, she said, she said shaking her head. Thank you, Sean finished typing and posted the comment. Now come here and kiss me, Sean said, pushing the laptop off to the side and grabbing Sinem. The laptop slid off the bed and onto the floor, leaving the screen open. The comment could still be seen. Great job on the win, fellas. Too bad the redhead ain't shit. Joseph. Funny video, guys, but what's up with that shirtless black guy? You couldn't have found one with a better body? He looks like he just got off the toilet. Joe posted the comment above Sean's and closed his laptop. He stood up, left his room, and trotted up the stairs. I'll be back later, Mom, Joe called as he opened the front door. He was starting his car a moment later. His phone rang. Joe answered. Hey, Joe said. You heading over soon? I'm about to call in for the pizza, his father said. Yeah, I just, got a, I just got in the car. I'll be there shortly, Joe told his father. Okay, he said and hung up. Joe made his way to his father in silence. He was taking a break from music, something that he did every so often. Joe did the same with film. He would take month-long breaks from things he liked. That way, when he returned to it, he enjoyed it more as a long-lost treasure. His father's house was 40 minutes away. It was a peaceful drive. The sun was slowly setting off to his left. Fresh snow lined the interstate on both sides. He weaved through the traffic effortlessly. Joe had always enjoyed driving. It gave him a sense of calm and control that he sometimes felt that he didn't always have. He thought about the upcoming day with excitement. The next couple of weeks in general should be good, he told himself. He pulled into his father's driveway. He himself was getting out of his own car with a large box of pizza. He nodded towards Joe. Perfect timing, he said. Joe parked his car next to his father's and got out. Sup, Joe said casually. Grab the two-liter out of the car for me, his father said. Joe grabbed a two-liter bottle of CRMS out of the car and helped his father into the house. The two walked into the kitchen and placed the items on the counter. Joe's father wiped his hands together and smiled at Joe. So, how was Thanksgiving, he asked sarcastically. Joe snorted as he grabbed two plates from the cabinet and passed one to his father. Not as bad as you'd expect, ac actually. The food was actually from Boston Market this year. <laughs> don't ask why, because I still don't know. But yeah, that combined with the four beers I drank made for a not-so-bad holiday. The game was kind of buns, Joe said. Tell me about it. I almost texted you when Romo threw that first interception. He's on your fantasy team, right? He almost was, but I decided against it last minute, Joe said. He grabbed two slices of pizza and sat down on the kitchen table. His father followed suit. How's everything else? Are you ready to go back to school yet? His father asked. Joe rolled his eyes. As ready as I'll ever be. In all honesty, I think it'll do me some good, but not in the same way that people think it should. I was starting to get bored sitting at home this whole semester. I had this friend at work that moved to Virginia, and I hardly saw anyone from YFC the whole time. Everyone's doing their own thing, Joe said. What about that girl of yours, uh, Jennifer? She's still in the picture. I see her at least every other weekend, if not more. Sometimes I drive down to Philly, I spend the night at her dorm. Sometimes she sleeps over here. 
the majority of the shit I've done is rewatch Mad Men and try to work on my screenplay. The whole time I was working my way through three bottles of Captain Morgan, Joe said sardonically. What? Joe's father asked in shock. Yeah, it's something I'm not proud of, Joe said laughing. I drank rum and coke and watched TV just about every night. It's got to the point where I was thinking, I really need to do something. So, bottom line, I'm not all that upset about going back to school. Joe's father just laughed warmly. I bet. What happened to young folks? Why did you guys stop filming? I know Rich is out of commission, but what about Sean and Chris? What, are, what were they doing? Chris works a lot now. Six to two, five days a week. Whenever he's not working, he's sleeping, Joe said chuckling. I don't blame him. I probably would too. Sean is busy doing his own thing. He's going to school for psychology and stuff. I didn't want to force them to keep filming if they weren't interested, you know? I understand. That sucks, but it's good that you don't blame them. Now is the time to focus on writing. Write something good, something that all of you guys can do, and they'll have no choice but to want to make it. Tell me about the script you're writing on. Well, you've seen our tools web series with Chris and Sam. I've been working on the feature version of that, though I haven't made much progress. Feature-length films are a lot different than five-minute skits. I haven't really gotten the hang of it, to be honest. It's definitely something I'm going to have to master in the future. Plus, I learned that I'm really meticulous when it comes to writing at length. I want everything to fit in and have, and have a purpose. I don't want there to be a misplaced line anywhere in the script, so I'll end up spending a whole day on three pages of dialogue, Joe said. His father listened intently, his eyes laden heavy with interest. I wouldn't worry about that. Everyone has their own process. You keep talking about how you don't want to go to school, but you just admitted to having a major problem that you need to fix. So go to school and fix it. Do you have a screenwriting class this upcoming semester? He asked. I do, Joe said. Okay then, find out what you're going to do and work on it. Simple as that. It won't hurt to learn something while you're there, Joe. I know that you think those people don't have anything to teach you, but they do. Experience is a valuable thing. The two sat and ate their pizza slices in silence for a moment. They both got up and returned for more slices. Joe sipped on the Sierra Mist and looked out the window, feeling completely at ease. So are you excited for tomorrow? His father asked, breaking the silence. Definitely. I think we have a really good chance of winning. And if we get the prize money, me and Kyle talked about spending it on a feature. Maybe even tools if I can finish it and make it good, Joe said. Well, good luck. I'm rooting for you. I thought the video was hilarious for, it, for what it was, his father said. I agree. It's really not our style of humor, but I think that's exactly why it's doing so well. It appeals more to the general public's perception of comedy. I think we have a pretty good chance. I'm excited for it, Joe said. Me too, his father said. He looked down at his phone that was strapped to his belt and back up at Joe. He seemed hesitant. What's wrong? Joe asked, noticing his father's agitation. His father looked at Joe for a moment. He chewed on his cheek, looking for the exact words that he wanted to use. Listen, Joe, there's something I have to tell you tonight. I have to go to Minnesota for a couple of months for a possible job opportunity. I just fell into a week ago or so, and I didn't want to tell you over the phone. I'm leaving at the end of December, he said. Joe continued chewing his pizza as he let the words his father was saying to him sink in. What's the job? Joe asked. These ranchers have a position open that needs to be filled. Basically like a middleman between supermarkets, restaurants, establishments like that, and them. They want me to sell their beef and dairy. Joe nodded his head slowly. And you're leaving at the end of this month. That's pretty short notice. Yeah, I know. It was an opportunity that I had to capitalize on. It might turn out to be a complete bust. It's going to be commission-based, but they offered me the job, and I told them I'd take it. I'm expecting a call from them sometime tonight to finalize some details. Joe continued nodding his head. Hmm. How long did you say you were going to be there? He asked. A couple of months. It could be three. Like I said, I don't know if the whole thing is going to work out or not, his father said. Joe thought for a moment. Anxiousness began creeping into his mind, a sense of worry that always came when people he cared about left him. If the job does work out, would you be there indefinitely? Joe asked cautiously. His father spread out his hands as he searched for the correct answer. Joe knew the answer. The phone on his father's belt began vibrating. He grasped it and looked quickly at Joe. It's still too early to tell. I have to take this, he said quickly. He stood up and headed out of the kitchen. He turned around when he got to the entrance and looked at Joe. I'm really sorry I'm just dropping this on you now. 
I really am, his father said. Joe nodded. His father exited the kitchen, leaving Joseph alone. He felt empty inside. He tried not to acknowledge the feeling, but he found it hard not to. He tried to rationalize it away. He tried to put himself in his father's shoes. He's got to make money, Joe said to himself. If the job is in Minnesota, then that's where he's got to go. It made sense. He could understand the reasons behind it. It didn't make him feel any better. He thought about his father not coming back. Joe could tell from the way his father avoided answering that question that it was a huge possibility. He could feel himself sink deeper into the chair that held his weight. It felt as if the anxiety he had added, he had added an invisible 20 pounds in, onto his body. Joe's phone vibrated. He looked at it absently. He figured it would be Chris or Richard trying to finalize some scheduling details about tomorrow. He thought about tomorrow and anticipation and excitement seeped slowly back into him. It was Jennifer who had texted him. The excitement vanished. He read the text. Seriously, Joe, I really can't get over that you don't want me to come tomorrow. I want to be happy for you and wish you luck, but I just can't. What you're doing is so wrong. Joe sat and read the text twice. He responded back to her. His fingers typed words into his phone numbly, without feeling. Now it's not really a good time to talk about it, he said. She texted back quickly. She ignored him. Is it so horrible that I want to be a part of your life? Does this have something to do with you not calling me your girlfriend? Is that it? He lost his patience with her. Listen, I don't have the time to coddle your fragile feelings right now. I'm sorry I have other stuff that I'm dealing with. I'm going without you tomorrow because it's the first time I've had since Rich moved to hang out with all three of my friends at one time. That's what I want. I want to have a good time in New York with my friends. I don't see them often enough as it is anymore, and I could do without you attempting to ruin the experience for me. He waited for a response. None came. He waited for his father to return. He didn't. His anger quickly changed to guilt. He was taking his frustration out on Jennifer, and he knew it. It was displacement pure and simple. Joe sighed heavily as he started texting her once more. I'm sorry. I'm at my dad's right now. I'll call you when I'm home. It was all he could say at that moment. She texted him back shortly. His father was entering the room. I do wish you luck tomorrow. I hope you guys win. I love you. Richard stood at the same corner outside his dorm building in Manhattan that he had been standing the last time Joe had seen him. He was wearing a heavy winter coat this time. Sean took after, took off after him in a sprint, shouting, Richie boy, at the top of his lungs. Joe, Chris, and Kate followed behind. Rich pat Sean slightly on the back as he was embraced. The other three caught up to them seconds later. Sup, Joe said to Rich. Sup, Joe. What's up, Chris? Hi, Kate, Rich said. Hi, Rich. I feel weird bit for being the only girlfriend who came, Kate said jokingly. I think you're the only girl invited. You could look at it as a good thing. Sanem's an entertaining relatives from Persia, anyway, or Iran. I don't know Joe's excuse for not bringing Jennifer, Sean said. I kind of thought that none of us were bringing the females. Like, none of us? Joe looked at Chris with the corner of his mouth, curling into a sarcastic smirk. Yeah, I didn't get that memo, bro. I already told you, don't assume anything. Don't assume anything, Chris said. Anyway, you guys ready to go, or did you want to put some stuff in my dorm first, Rich asked. The group looked around amongst each other. Everyone shrugged. Let's go. I'm trying to get that open bar and fuck shit up, Sean said. Let's go, Rich repeated. Rich started off in a direction that he seemed to be sure of. Joe and the others followed him. Sean chirped amongst everyone about how excited he was to have the group together. You're not an intrusion, even though I might just be saying that to make you feel like you're not an intrusion. But I've always liked you, Kate. Seriously. You're all right in my book, Sean said. Rich rolled his eyes and looked at Joe. The two exchanged a quick laugh at Sean's antics. Rich led them into the subway. The trip to the location was a quick one. After the subway, it was a short ten-minute walk to the event. Joe wasn't sure if the place was going to be a theater or a bar, given the nature of the invitation. When he walked in, he discovered that it was a little bit of both. It was a large, dark lounge area with big ceilings. A big bar stood off to the left corner besides the entrance. At the very back of the place, there was a large stage with a wide screen at the center of it. Joe noticed a projector hanging from the ceiling. All around there were couches and chairs of varying degrees of size and cushion. There was a second floor. To Joe's right, there was a long walkway, surrounded by dark water on either side. The walkway branched off into six or seven different spaces, each one having its own large semicircular couch and a set of tables and chairs. The water enclosed each separate pod, making it secluded from the rest. 
Kyle was sitting in the nearest pod. His body was relaxed as he sat talking to his girlfriend, Maya. The rest of the group was with him as well. Pat sat off to the side by himself in an upright chair holding a beer. Joe recognized the other two who had helped make the video that won, Henry and Xavier. They sat on the couch talking amongst themselves. Kyle looked over his shoulder and his face lit up with surprise. He waved to Joe's group and beckoned them over with a quick short shot of hello. Mr. Henderson! It's been too fucking long, my friend, Sean said as he quickly hurried over to greet the group. Fucking trippy-ass place we got going on here. Fucking water and shit. Pretty cool. Sean took Kyle's hands in greeting. How you doing, man? Long time no see, Kyle said with a genuine smile. He greeted the rest of the group. Chris made a quick introduction to everyone that had not met his girlfriend, Kate. Yeah, you can all take a seat. I think, at least. We got here like ten minutes ago, and these pod thingies had this big reserve sign on each of them. We kind of just took that and put it somewhere else. I don't even know if it's reserved for us. It could be, Kyle said laughing. Sean snorted. That's awesome. Who else could it be reserved for if not of the, the winners of the whole fucking competition, right? Sean said in a loud voice. Joe laughed quietly and took a seat next to Kyle. Everyone else got themselves situated. Sean, Chris, and Richard went off to the bar to bring back drinks. Kate sat quietly on the couch as she waited for Chris to return. Kyle smiled, smiled widely at Joe. So how have you been, man? he asked. What have you been up to since I last saw you? Joe shrugged. Nothing too interesting. I took the semester off just to take a break from school. I'm transferring to Richard's College in the spring, the new school. Kyle nodded his head. I've heard of that place. I don't know who's gone there, though. It's relatively new, isn't it? No pun intended, he said with a laugh. Yeah, it is. Uh, I know that Paul Dana went there. So did Jesse Eisenberg, Jonah Hill, and Bradley Cooper. I did some research, Joe said modestly. And Kevin Smith went too, but he didn't graduate. Oh, but of course he didn't, Kyle said sarcastically. Doesn't that just perfectly fit his M.O.? Could you imagine Kevin Smith finishing college? No, I couldn't, Joe agreed. Anyway, that's what I'm up to. How's California life, though? I know that you got that job with uh, Kevin Spacey's production company, which is fucking awesome. How's that going? Kyle scratched the back of his head and smiled. It's actually pretty crazy, man. I could describe to you what it's like over there, and you'd think I'm just giving you a cliche monologue from an overdone movie. But L.A. is literally exactly how people depicted it. It's frustrating, but at the same time, I went there knowing this is what I want to do, so I actually find it to be a lot of fun. What's frustrating about it? Joe asked, interested. His friends returned with beers. Sean slapped Joe on the back and handed him a glass of Blue Moon. What are you guys talking about? Something boring? Sean asked. Cal chuckled. You know how I said I missed you? He asked Sean. Sean thought about it. I don't think you did tell me you missed me, Sean said. Good, Kyle said, grinning. Sean scowled at Kyle humorously. He turned his back to the two and immersed himself in conversation with Richard and Chris. Kyle and Joe exchanged a look of full humor. Joe shrugged and took a sip of his beer. So what's frustrating about it? He repeated the question. So much rejection. An unbelievable amount of rejection. I've probably pitched like five show ideas in the past five months. Each of them make it through a certain stage in the process, but in the end, none of them made it as far as pitching it to a network or, or making a pilot. What I do mostly is read through scripts. That's how I spend most of my time at work, reading and editing. Which is great, since that's what I went to school for, Kyle said. Joe considered that for a moment. Yeah, I can see where the frustration would come from. But I think it's great that you're working in your department. I mean, I envy you for that. I hope I can get as lucky as you when I finish school. Yeah, me and Maya both got super lucky. Maya landed a graphic designs job that she loves that pays her super well. And that was in like the first couple of weeks of moving there. I went to two interviews before I got hired at my job. And it's ridiculous because we both went over there expecting to be poor for the first couple of years while we looked for jobs in our field. She thought she was going to have to be a waitress for a time period. We got really lucky, Kyle said. Damn, Joe said, digesting everything. I really want to meet you out there when, when I'm done school. I want everyone to come. I keep telling YFC that we're wasting time here. I keep telling them that. I don't know. I think once I finish at the new school, I'm just going to force them to leave that summer. Kyle laughed. Drag Pat along with you. I still firmly believe that we could all do fantastic things together. This is a great group, and I'm glad I met all of you. Even if we don't win tonight, I still want to make a feature with you guys sometime in the future. I feel like we have more talent sitting in this booth right here than the rest of this room combined.
I really mean that. I feel the same way, Joe said calmly. He looked at Kyle as he would a comrade in arms. He was so happy to have met someone who felt as he did about the people around him. Kyle was Joe's kindred spirit. So you think we're going to win, Kyle? Sean asked, interrupting. I hope so, otherwise I just wasted a lot of money on our plane tickets, Kyle said jokingly. The proceedings started shortly after. A man stood on stage and welcomed the finalists to the 2012 Film Racing Award screening. He greeted the winners of the various cities. Joe was surprised to discover just how many cities were involved. Places outside of the U.S. had entered. Guatemala and Canada. Joe looked at the lineup of films. Unbearable, the last urban Kodiak was number 11 out of 23 on the queue. He sat back on the couch and got comfortable for an hour and a half of short films. Joe wasn't very impressed with the first couple of films. He hadn't expected to be. He kept his eye out for the ones that would give their project the most competition. In the first six films, he saw none. Five films later, Unbearable was on the screen. Joe's group tittered with confident excitement. So far, so good, Joe heard Sean whispering to Richard. The video started with an opening shot of Kyle looking agitated in an outfit and hairstyle that was straight out of the 1980s. He's a nuisance. Don't want him. Don't need him. He's been here for too long. I say pick him up and lock him up. Put him behind bars. Not zoo bars. Actual bars. That's how I feel. Joe looked around the room and gauged the audience's reaction. A couple of chuckles went throughout the room. The video went on. Joe's part came up next. He sat and listened intently for the anticipated response. You know, I, I see him around, sometimes walking around on the street. I'm just thinking, why? Joe said in a New York accent. And my little brother, you know, he's got that disease, you know, like retard. The place exploded in uproarious laughter. Everyone in Joe's circle looked at him with appraisal. Sean leaned over and slapped him on the back. Laughter continued throughout the rest of the time Joe was on screen. Joe felt warm with satisfaction. The video went on netting sporadic laughs from the audience. Sean and Chris got a couple of chuckles from the interaction. Not our finest hour, Sean admitted as his scene ended. Richard gained several laughs from his portrayal as an employee of the Bear Sanitation Committee, though the audience did not respond as warmly as they did to Joe's performance until Pat's turn was up. The audience erupted in more laughter at Pat as they watched his character feed a costumed bear peanuts the whole time giggling childishly. That's still funny, Kyle said, shaking his head, laughing. Joe noticed that Pat's face was blushing as the video ended. Applause went throughout the room. Joe and Kyle exchanged a look of approval and hopefulness. We might actually have a shot, Joe thought. The next film made Joe's faith waver. From the first shot, Joe realized this film would be the one to beat. The camera was mounted on a crane high up in the sky, overlooking a man at a gas station. Joe's heart sank along with the camera as it swooped in low to focus in on the man. The gas station went out of focus simultaneously as the man's face grew to a close-up. The man looked extremely tired and extremely agitated. Twenty seconds had passed and not a single word had been spoken. Joe knew their own film was in trouble. The film proceeded to wow the audience with perfect shot composition and production, produ production quality. It focused on one actor only, but the man was able to carry the whole three minute and thirty second video by himself. It was scored perfectly from the, for the pacing, and whenever there was actually dialogue, it was French and, with subtitles. Fuck, Sean whispered as the film ended. Watch that be the one that wins, Kyle said to Joe. They announced the winners at the end of the screening. Joe saw a couple of potentials throughout the show. By the end of it, Joe's confidence on the win had faltered. The entire group waited with bated breath as the man announced the winners of the various categories, saving the, gra the grand prize for last. They won Best Acting Ensemble. Kyle, Henry, and Xavier went on stage to accept the award. They forced Pat to come up with them. Kyle gave a quick thank you speech and stepped off. More awards were rattled off. Best cinematography went to the French film that was made by the Canadian entries. They also took award for best acting and best writing. Other films grabbed awards in best makeup and best sound and editing. After another 30 minutes, the moment of truth was finally upon them. They were ready to announce the overall winners. They started with the fifth runner-up. Joe and the others waited for their name to be called. It wasn't. Fourth runner-up came and went, then third, then second. Joe was not surprised with the films that were chosen to be in the top five. When it got to the last runner-up in first place, Joe knew that it would not be unbearable. And the runner-up for this year's 2012 film racing competition goes to The Boy and the Bike, the man announced. Applause went throughout the room as everyone prepared themselves to hear who the winner was. Joe already knew, as did mostly everyone else in his corner, 
Still, though, they had to wait for their suspicions to be confirmed. The runner-ups took the stage and gave brief thanks to everyone that helped out with making the short film. The announcer came back on. And now, for the moment of truth, he said, the grand prize winner of $7,000 and brand new film equipment provided to us by Sony get, goes to... The large screen next to him displayed the winner before he said it. La Station. Kyle dropped his head as a pod across the walkway from them, exploded in cheers. Joe noticed the actor from the film throwing his hands in the air. He led an entourage onto the stage to accept their award. Joe looked at Kyle and felt pity. He realized then that Kyle had really been expecting to win. Why else would he fly all the way out here for one night, Joe rationalized. Joe heard Sean whispering something to Richard. In a moment, the two burst into laughter. Sean slapped his knee and held his stomach as the two giggled in unison. Chris and Kate were already gathering their things to leave. Maya, Kyle's girlfriend, rubbed his back on and put her head on his shoulder. He shrugged at her touch as though he were trying to tell her it was not a big deal to him. The announcer was on the stage again, inviting everyone to the after party, which was a couple of blocks away. Henry cut in under the announcer's voice and leaned over to join the others. Me and Xavier are going to this party in Brooklyn, and we wanted to extend an invitation to you guys. That is, if you guys weren't planning on going to the gay-ass after-party, he said. Joe looked at his friends, who in turn looked at each other. They all exchanged an indifferent shrug. The showcase was finished. People were already clearing out of the building. Joe's group gathered their things and followed everyone outside. The Canadians were still celebrating the win several yards away. Kyle looked at them with disdain. So I'm sorry I made you guys come all the way up here to watch our asses lose, Kyle apologized to Joe and the others. Don't bother, man. You're the one who traveled here all the way from L.A. Plus, I was coming either way for the open bar, Sean said with a grin. Kyle nodded his head. Henry and Xavier edged further away from the group, looking agitated. So are you guys going to go with them? Kyle asked, indicating towards Henry. You're not coming? Richard asked. Nah, me, Maya, and Pat are going to the after party. Just in the feeble hopes of getting some networking done and possibly getting something out of this trip, Kyle said bitterly. Henry and Xavier inched further away. So you guys coming with us or not? Henry asked impatiently. Joe looked at Kyle. His face was lined with disappointment and subtle anger. Joe felt for him, his comrade. Sean was the one who spoke up for the group. Well, uh, I guess we're going to go to the Brooklyn Banger on account of the fact that I've never been to a motherfucking Brooklyn Banger. Am I right or am I right? Richard and Chris laughed along with Sean. They walked over and joined Henry and Xavier, leaving Joe alone with the other group. Kyle looked at Joe. Maya and Pat had already started heading off in the direction of the after party. All right, so uh, I guess I'll see you later. Thanks for coming again. Have fun at the party, Kyle said. He turned around to go. I'll see you later, man. It was nice seeing you, Joe said. Joe walked over to his group as he looked over his shoulder at Kyle. So let's get this show on the road, Henry said with a flourish. He led the charge down Manhattan to the nearest subway. Something ate at Joe's inside. He had to say something. He tapped Rich and Sean on the shoulder. They turned and looked at him, curious. What's up, Sean asked. I think we should go to the after party. Think about it. Kyle came all this way to be with us, and now we're going to a different party. That's kind of fucked up, don't you think? Joe whispered so Sh Henry and Xavier couldn't hear. Kyle didn't come here to hang out with us, man. Kyle came here to win. Now he's unhappy that he didn't, which is understandable. I'm not going to that fucking after party to console him, though. He's got his hot, he's got his hot ass girlfriend for that shit. He definitely doesn't need me, Sean said. Plus, the last after party that we went to sucked balls, Rich added. Joe sighed and looked over his shoulder once more. He could still see Kyle a couple of blocks away. He walked with his arm around his girlfriend and his head down. Joe watched them. He could, catch up, he could catch up to them if he wanted to. He didn't. 